24, verse 49. Luke 24, 49. The post-risen Christ has appeared to his downtrodden, depressed, discouraged, disillusioned disciples. But he comes with this command and promise. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Father, I thank you for uh, your promises through your word. Prophets have made declaration. And we watched through scripture as they have come to pass. And God, we stand here in this room not because of everything you've already done. We're grateful for it. But God, we are still standing in the hope of what you have yet to do. God, we're standing in the promise of what you said would happen. God, we're standing in the promise like those disciples of years ago in the interim. God, we're here in this room and we are intending, God, on seeing with our eyes the promise that you have given to us, released in our hearts, God, in our homes, in our cities, God, in our futures. So we've come this morning with expectation. God, this isn't just another date on the calendar. But God, this day, this Pentecost Sunday, I'm praying, Father, that you would do exactly as you have promised that you would do. We need another Pentecost, God. We need another Pentecost to flow into our lives. God, we need fire. We need wind. God, we need outpouring. God, we need something to happen until our spirits are overcome and until we can't act normal until it overcomes us until you indwell us God we need that kind of move of your spirit in our lives in our homes in our churches in our cities God we need another Pentecost so we stand in this room with anticipation God we stand with excitement God, we stand knowing that you have never let us down in every word you've ever given. It's true. You're not slack concerning your promise. So this morning, God, we're waiting. We're waiting on you this morning, Jesus. And we're praying that you would do everything you promised that you would do. If anybody's waiting with me this morning, would you clap hands to the Lord for a moment and just lift your voice for a minute? Someone look at your neighbor and tell them, wait for it. You may be seated. It's become a little phrase that's part of the vernacular of our society. I, I, I don't know if it's because of the social media or the, the uh, ability that we have on our hands to communicate. But uh, how many have ever had somebody just kind of show you a little video clip? Maybe it's something that's funny or maybe it's something they just really want you to learn. Maybe it's a message, a veiled message they're trying to get you to receive. Here's some great toothpaste. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Not on my notes. Stick to the notes, Jack. Um, but, you know, you've been partway through the video, and somewhere along the line, you just kind of checked out. And then they said, well, wait for it. Wait, wait for it. Anyone ever had that happen? Or is it just my kids and my ADD? <laughs> but how often have I heard that phrase, wait for it? We, we uh, live in a society that we don't like waiting very much. We, well, I, I'm grateful that I don't have to wait a long time for some stuff. I like rolling. I like prepaying for my coffee. <laughs> in some places, it doesn't seem to matter that you've already paid for it. It doesn't seem to matter that it's supposed to be all ready for you when you get there. But sometimes it works. I'm just telling you this morning, I like it when it works. I don't like waiting a whole lot. I like, I like moving. I like trying to get some stuff done. I, I, like, uh, I like ambition to come into fruition. I, I like that. I, I don't like waiting a whole lot. But, but there, in the scripture, we can see that often God requires us to wait. If we were to look in the, the scripture, the past, um, you looked at the feasts in, in ancient Israel. There were... <clears throat> There were often these seasons where God would allow his people to wait from one 
festival to the next festival. One example is one that we're in today, Passover and Easter. Now, Passover has passed, and the next holiday on the Hebrew calendar is Pentecost, which is today. The Lord designed the festivals of Israel to focus the Israelites' hearts and minds on various elements of his person and his plan. The festivals, they would point to the forecoming of a Messiah, but not just that. They would speak to the future that we would have as the church. The promise that God would give a worldwide revival is there in ancient scripture. The promise is in those feasts. If you were to look the word uh, Pentecost up, it's the Greek word for 50. It's a, a New Testament term. Hebrew, they had their own term. That, that Hebrew term meant, um, meant waiting for the law to be given. The, the seven sevens, that it's seasons of sevens. And seven's very important. It's the number of fruition. That's why we have uh, 49 years, the 50th year is the, the year of Jubilee, the celebration. So these festivals all played into God's plan. How many know that God just has a master calendar that he operates off of? I still get frustrated sometimes when God's not operating on my day timer. God doesn't seem to be sinking to my Google calendar. God, God just doesn't, he doesn't seem to be connected to what I, I, my plans are at all sometimes. And, and that leaves us in this season called waiting. Waiting sometimes. Tap your neighbor and say, wait for it. Say, I don't know where Pastor Jack's going yet, but I hope he gets there. My reply to that this morning is wait for it. But those festivals were seasons where God would command his people, this is what you need to do. The festival uh, requirements weren't optional. They weren't subject to sentiments. They, it, it didn't matter how your day was going. That didn't determine how you celebrated the festival. It was outlined. It was clear. Uh, I, I just say it like this. In the Old Testament, worship wasn't optional. But can I remind us all this morning, in the New Testament, it's not optional either. Now, sometimes we come and we, we, we're waiting for the right thing to move us the right way. We're waiting for our favorite song. We're waiting for different things. But, but worship isn't intended to be optional. When they came into that feast of Pentecost, they had sheaves that were to be waved. They had two loaves that were held high. And they didn't ever come empty-handed. They came on purpose with a purpose. Everybody. Someone say everybody. Maybe we could do it just one more time this morning. Why don't we just lift our hands for a minute and praise God for, for just a second because of how good he is. Not, not because he, he mandated, but just because we have the option to worship God for a minute. I, I wonder if you just kind of lift hands and lift your voice from uh, all the way up in the balcony. I can see you guys. Why don't we lift our hands and begin to worship God for a moment out in overflow? Could, could someone just say, God, it's not just because it's mandated today, but it's because you're worthy at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. He's worthy this morning. He's worthy this morning. He's worthy this morning. Yeah, see how, how it just kind of begins to shift in the supernatural realm because praise is more than just an activity that stays here. Praise is something that says, God, we're inviting you. There's some promise that comes along with praise. God said, I'll inhabit the praise of my people. So when we begin to praise God, we're saying, God, it's an open invitation. God, it's, a, it's just a, a welcome mat for you to show up. Show up in our lives. Show up in our church. Show up because it's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday, Pentecostals. That's a time that we can praise him. Praise him. There's many, there's many traditions that if you were to look, they're attached to Pentecost in Scripture. It says that uh, they, the tradition would say in Jewish literature that King David was born and died on the day of Pentecost. We don't know. We don't know, but tradition would say that he did. Tradition says that Ruth was triumphant on this holiday. In fact, the entire book of Ruth is read in the synagogue on Pentecost to honor this tradition. It said that the Torah was given on Pentecost. One of the Hebrew titles for the holiday is simply the season of the giving of the law. The season of the giving of the law. You can't, 
You can have Passover without Pentecost, but you can't have Pentecost without Passover. You need Passover. So let's just step back for a minute and think what happened 50 days prior to this. We know it was Easter Sunday. Some of you are thinking, seven weeks since Easter already? And then you're thinking, man, that went by fast. Or is that just me? Time seems to have flown by, and here we are seven weeks after Easter. But if you'll think back with me to what we celebrate in Easter, it's, it's Passover. The first Passover was that miraculous events. Ten plagues have happened in Egypt. And just before the tenth plague, they paint the doorposts with the blood of the perfect lamb. And then they roast that lamb and they ate it. And they had their staffs in their hand. They had their shoes on their feet. Their bags were packed. They were heading out. The Red Sea parts on their exodus. That's why they call it the book of Exodus. And, and they walk through and then the this, this Red Sea closes in behind uh, them and buries Pharaoh in the Red Sea. Just incredible. And just as incredible as that first Passover was, Israel's just marched out of Egypt. They're no longer slaves, but sons and daughters. There was something more incredible coming. That was the beginning of what God was doing. They didn't receive it all in one moment. God said, I'm just putting a little space in between here. I'm putting a, a season between Passover and Pentecost. And if you were to travel with them 50 days in the wilderness, you'd find that they landed at Mount Sinai. And it's on the first Pentecost that Moses goes up on the mountain and God gives the law to Israel. It's fire and smoke. It's lightning and thunder. And in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1, it said that God spoke all these words. Uh, you know, this, is, this Pentecost thing was birthed in the fire. This Pentecost thing isn't a quiet thing. As a matter of fact, we all get a little, uh, we get a little uneasy when church gets really quiet. And sometimes with masks on, it gets really quiet. Sometimes you're, you're just kind of, I, I, we don't, I think we're, we've been doing this for a little while now. We don't, we don't do it for feedback all the time. It isn't about what we get out of it. We're just wanting to make sure that somebody gets something out of it. Yeah. And the best way to get something out of it is to engage. And we engage by, by corresponding. I, I love the way we do church. I, I like it when, when we can amen. It's not just amen and the preacher. It's amen and God's word. It, it's about response, not because of what we get up here out of it at the pulpit. It's about what you're getting out of it out there in the pew. That's what, that's what this whole interactive worship is like. So, so Pentecost didn't start in some quiet space where God just kind of passed the Ten Commandments to Moses and, and he just quietly tiptoed down off the mountain. Can I, can I remind everybody that Pentecost start happened with lightning and thunder? It happened. It happened with, with this activity and this motion and fire and smoke and stuff was burning. People were... You didn't know what was... Welcome to Pentecost! That's how this all got started. So if we're true blue, if we're going back to origin, it's going to be a little exciting around here sometime. It's going to get a little unusual sometime. You don't know what to expect when you show up in a Pentecostal service. I hope that the fire falls and I hope that the smoke still comes in the room. I, I pray that the fire still falls today. Someone say that's Pentecost. Pentecost was waiting for it. He said, you're just making that fit a little bit, but hang with me. Exodus 20, God spoke all those words. The rabbis have said that, that, that each of the commandments was said simultaneously. God spoke it to Israel. It was his voice. It wasn't just some, uh, some you know, they, they had, Moses had them on the law, but God's voice spoke those commandments. The law was given so that we would have that option for perfection. His voice communicated it to his people. And in that communication, there was the option. The option. God had to, to say, you know, here's the option for perfection. You have the option to be perfect. Here's the Ten Commandments. If you can live these commandments to the letter of the law, then you have perfection. Perfection. You, in, in that place of perfection, then you have the option to receive power. And God knew that we knew that we could live up to perfection. 
We can't live up to the demands of the law. Now, I hope that we're not failing the Ten Commandments every day. I hope that we're all trying to live out God's plan and God's purpose. And, but how many, how many could honestly say with me this morning that, that you failed? Good, we're all, we're all in the same room. The law proved that we didn't have the power. You could try your very best. You could give it your level one effort. But at some point, you're going to fail yourself and you're going to fail God. The law proved that we couldn't be perfect on our own. The law proved that the power that was there that could be received couldn't be received because we couldn't live up to the demands of the law. But don't dismay. Because Pentecost has begun, but Pentecost hasn't yet fully come. The promise is there in the picture of the feasts. There would be thousands of feasts before we read the significance of what began on Sinai in Acts chapter 2. We would wait. Someone say wait for it. We would wait through the judges and the kings and the prophets and the priests. We would wait for the promise to come. Israel would wage wars and suffer hardships, but... Wait for it, Israel. It's coming. The promise of Pentecost is on the horizon. Don't give up. Pentecost has just begun. So they would watch as their temple would be destroyed. They would march back as a remnant and rebuild walls. They would read the word and stand in hope of what was promised would be given to them. They would wait for it. And we can just fast forward down through scripture into the New Testament that the Messiah would come. Jesus would be born of a virgin and he would live his life and he would teach for three and a half years, but then they would reject their own Messiah and put him to an open shame on a cross. He would become the perfect Passover lamb and they would bury him in the borrowed tomb on Passover. But wait for it because Pentecost is coming. And it's in that season that we find the scripture we started the message with tonight. That he met his disciples and he told them, tarry in Jerusalem until. Tarry until you're endued with power from on high. Tarry until you receive what I've promised all the way through scripture. Don't give up now, disciples. I'm not finished yet. You're just going to have to wait for it. Here's what I know about humanity. If you want it, you'll wait for it. If you really want it, then you're willing to wait for it. I've seen people wait with their phones all beat to pieces because they don't want the 12. They want the next iteration of iPhone. Uh, They don't want the almost new version. They're going to wait until. There's something about waiting until. And, and there was 49 days of waiting when, uh, when, when they were told, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And until the comforter comes, until the promise is yours, go and wait. And, and, and if you'll just think back with me to Easter, that if someone had said to all of us on Easter Sunday, you know what? Let's just wait here until we receive the promise. I don't know what the shower facilities were like in an upper room in Jerusalem. I don't know what the on-hand toothpaste supply was like. Let's hit it again. I don't know. I don't know what your patience level would be like. But if you were told to wait, I think sometimes there's there's that season of waiting where we can get frustrated. There's a season of... In the waiting when, when we say, you know what, I, I got so much to do. I'm just going to, I've already given this three and a half years of my life. I, I've got a lot I've got to get done. I, I think I'm just going to go back to the old fishing boat and going to get some stuff fixed up. I'm, I'm going to sit back down at the tax collector table. And uh, I, got, I, I, I got some friends that are, are still in the business I don't know what the disciples were thinking. I don't, as a matter of fact, I don't know what 120 were thinking. I'm guessing we probably have close to 120 this morning. I don't know. I don't see Eric's head around out there to ask. I'm going to guess we're somewhere around that in the room this morning. Now, can you imagine? I don't, and I don't know what architecture in ancient Israel was like. But they were waiting in an upper room. I'm going to guess it was some hot days when they probably felt like a cool breeze would be a good thing. I'm going to guess that they didn't feel like sitting there any longer 
at some point. But something on the inside, if you want it, you'll wait for it. Something on the inside of them said, I'm not giving up yet because the promise has yet to come. He said, wait until. And so we got yesterday under our belt and we're halfway through today. But if it doesn't come until tomorrow, I made my mind up. I'm going to wait until we're endued with power from on high. I'm going to wait until we receive everything that God has promised for us. And, and if they had done the math, they probably could have said, you know, the last great event was Passover. The next great event is Pentecost. So I'm going to wait until Pentecost, until I get the promise that God has for me and they waited the bible says until pentecost in acts 2 is the beginning of those verses that we love to read so much when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues someone say sinai that fire still comes along with Pentecost. Cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We need another Pentecost. But we've got to want it, CCC. We've got to want it, online audience. We, we've got to want it, overflow this morning. I'm wondering if anybody in the room is saying, God, I don't know what all the world is telling me that I need. But this is what I do know. I need another Pentecost. I need another Pentecost. It says they began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit gave them the utterance. So Pentecost is... Uh, how we identify Pentecost. Uh, we are a Pentecostal church to the core. The foundation of who we are started at Pentecost. That's how this, you, this isn't built on 71 Downing Street footing course. This church is built on what was started in Acts 2 upper room. We are a Pentecostal church. And so sometimes we got to remind ourselves that, we, that, that that's who we are. We can't become anything else. When we try and pull the church off of that foundation, I'm going to tell you what's left. Just nothing but broken brick and mortar and pieces and lies. But if we get this church built on the foundation of what this began in, then God's going to grow his church. God's going to continue growing his church. God did that because it was a fulfillment of Pentecost you see in Sinai Pentecost had begun but in Acts 2 Pentecost was fulfilled you see the scripture says it like this and when the day of Pentecost was fully come and we can read that sometimes but don't stop there because the day of Pentecost had fully come but the day of Pentecost was not fully done it had come. It had fully come. But it was not fully done. The disciples could have looked at themselves and said, that is what we've been waiting for seven weeks for. Let's get out of here. I'm going to the diplomat. And I'm ordering a number seven chicken ball special. <laughs> Suit yourself. I'm going to McDonald's for a Big Mac and an extra large fry. I got seven weeks of sheeps. I got seven weeks of who knows what. No, no, no. I'll tell you what the disciples did because Holy Ghost fire does something to the inside of you. Holy Ghost fire won't let you sit by. Holy Ghost fire says, ah, this isn't just for me. I've got to share this with somebody. Holy Ghost fire says, the world needs what I've got. Holy Ghost fire says, I could just let it impact this room, but this room is too small for what God wants to do in this city. So I need Holy Ghost and fire to touch the world around me. The day of Pentecost was fully come, but the day of Pentecost was not fully done. 
So they stumble out into the streets and Peter preaches and people hear it. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all. Someone say all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, that's where we come in. The promise to them and their children, Jesus has already said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. He's already defined some of the areas that God's going to start the revival in. Jerusalem, Acts 2, fully come. But if God has his way, <laughs> Pentecost may fully come, but Pentecost isn't fully done. And the problem is, is that we can look at our own life and our own experience. And, and I can take you back to the place in St. John at Mark Drive Church. I can take you right to the square footage of where I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I can say, well, that is when Pentecost fully came into my life. But that's not what God intends because Pentecost can fully come. But Pentecost is not fully done. Because until we fulfill that scripture to all that are afar off, then we are still waiting on the promise that God has for us. I'm still waiting for it. I, I remember waiting to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I, I remember who was praying with me. Brother Jim Dudley was praying with me. James Dudley was praying for me. And he was just saying, come on, Jack. Just keep on praying. I, I remember, I'm just a little guy. I was little, I was little till grade 12, so I know I was little. <laughs> and I remember... The altar was emptying out, and we had good long altar services, but the altar was emptying out, but I was still seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why? I was waiting for it. Wait for it, Jack. Don't, come on, don't give up. That's it. Just keep on praying. Keep on praying. That's it. That's it. That's stammering. That's stammering lips. Just let it. I'm so glad for people that are willing to coach somebody until they pray through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I, I'm so glad that there is a definite end to what we're looking for. I'm glad that we still speak in tongues. I think that's what the Bible says, isn't it? Uh, we, we may need to go back in the, in the scripture just a little bit. And they began to, yes, sir, just checking. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We still live in that promise. Holy Ghost still fully comes. Pentecost still fully comes in our lives. But can I remind the aged church, can I remind the mature church that Pentecost is not fully done. And so until it is, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for overflow. I'm waiting for outpouring. I'm waiting for God to reach the world with Pentecostal power. You may as well let it go for a minute. That's the fire we're talking about. Come on, apostolic stand for a moment. I just want to shake the environment up for a minute. Someone shout for a minute. Somebody call out for a moment. Somebody exercise your Pentecostal right on Pentecostal Sunday. Come on, I'm waiting for it for a minute tonight. I'm waiting for it to happen in this room. I, I'm waiting for it to flow into this service this morning. Come on, if you want it, you'll wait for it. If you want it, you'll wait for it. Oh, Reke Amalako Sokorebea Shatora Baha. 
Hirato so rebe atai rabo shaka. Oh, come on, pray with me just for a moment. Come on, lift. Just lift both hands and create a funnel for the Holy Ghost to move in this room. Spirit of God, flow. Spirit of God, rest. In the name of Jesus. We can come back to the music this morning. You say, Pastor Jack, are you trying to add to what God? No, not at all. But I can look through scripture and disciples didn't stay in the upper room. They didn't. Wait there, the Bible says that that day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And it doesn't stop there. You can go to Acts 8, and it's the Samaritans that God reaches. Acts chapter 10, he breaks through the barrier into the Gentile world, and Cornelius' household is saved. The Bible, as a matter of fact, we mentioned all a few moments ago, while Peter yet spake these words in Acts 10, 44, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word in Acts 19 it's John's disciples who who are operating the, the in the level of truth that they know and 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 they didn't know that there was a holy they didn't know that there was more and the word is preached and it's received and and God just begins to grow the church and we know that that isn't the completion of it because here we are. I'm grateful for everything that happened in Azusa Street. I'm thankful for everything that happened in Topeka, Kansas. The turn of the century. Revival fires burned. I'm grateful for what God has done around the world. John, John, Sarah, I'm grateful for what God's done in Africa. I'm grateful for how God has moved. But God's not finished yet. I'm grateful for how revival fire burned in little old New Brunswick, Canada. But God's not done. I'm still waiting for it. Say, waiting for what, Pastor Dad? Joel 2.28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. I'm still waiting for it. I'm still waiting for that kind of revival. I, I'm still waiting for this building to be completely filled from the front to the back. I'm waiting for the... What, some people say, well, a, a pandemic. You know what pandemic means to me? Preparation for revival. I don't know why. I don't know how. But they may mean it for evil, but God can turn it for good. We're talking about revival. You say we waited through construction. We're excited about two weeks from now. Yeah, you know what it is? Preparation for revival. We're waiting for it. We're waiting for that kind of revival. So whatever God has got us doing, this 40 acres out here in the side field, I don't know what it's for, but I'm believing it's part of revival. believing it's part of what God's going to do in revival anybody waiting for it with me we're waiting for it music team can you help me sing this last song I'm preparing to close Just, I want us to to anticipate 
It's 12.10. I'm not asking you for 49 days. But we've waited. We know what it's like to wait a little bit. I've waited in line for a lot of stuff. I've waited in line in minus 20 degree temperatures for something on sale and Boxing Day Blitz or whatever it used to be called. I've waited in line to get on roller coasters, only be thrown around in a little milk cart for a few minutes. I've waited. I've waited through years of dating and a few months of engagement to watch Kathy walk down the aisle. I've waited 40 weeks for Kristen to be born and 40 weeks for Justin to be born. I, I've waited. It was worth the wait. If you want it, you'll wait for it. I want to see revival. So I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up two weeks in, two months in, two years in, two decades in. I want to see revival. Anybody want revival? Wait for it. We're going to see it. I'm done. I got a few more no's, but how many are ready for what God's about to do? How many are we? We've been through Passover. We've been through that season of waiting, but we're stepping into Pentecost when the day of Pentecost was fully come. I want to see revival. We just sing it together with us. Let's cue the lyrics.